This is Amir Tsarfati. I am super excited to be able to share with you this evening uh, from the city of Jerusalem, the city of the great king. What we're going to do right now is first start with up, an update of the last few hours, believe it or not, but uh, Israel was almost on the brinks of a war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Thankfully, the incident that started at 3 p.m. this afternoon, uh, right at the slopes of Mount Hermon, ended up without casualties to the Israelis and with the killing of a whole small group of uh, Hezbollah terrorists that tried to infiltrate into an Israeli IDF outpost on Mount Hermon. Now let's go back all the way to last Monday, because this is where all that thing started. Right after I ended my last Sunday, uh, Monday's uh, update, a couple hours later, Israel launched a massive, very, very large-scale strike on Iranian targets in the outskirts of Damascus and uh, mostly the international airport of Damascus, where the Iranians have several headquarters with some very um, high-level technology and uh, weapons. Israel destroyed several targets. Israel used F-16s that flew all the way into Syria, and it used also Apache helicopter gunships to launch rockets from the Israeli territory. That was one of the most comprehensive uh, strikes we've had in months. We left the Iranians, the Syrians, and everybody all around quite in a shock. And uh, it was evident then already that it was an Israeli strike. Now, not every time it seems like it's Israeli, uh, but this one was evident because the residents of northern Israel could hear everything, even from the t area of the Golan Heights. But the, the, the thing came a day later when uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Hezbollah is a Lebanese terrorist organization that started in the 1980s, backed by the newly uh, Ayatollah's regime in Iran. And uh, Hezbollah just published the fact that one of the people who died in that particular um, um, strike is a um, their um, terrorist, their operant. And uh, the Hezbollah sort of promised his people that, um, and that was, if I'm not mistaken, last year, that from now on, every time Israel will strike and kill an, Isra an Hezbollah soldier or warrior, that's how they call him, then they will have to strike back. So immediately from last Monday and, and the following Tuesday, of course, all the way until today, Israel was expecting some sort of a retaliation from the Hezbollah side. Now, before um, I move to what happened today, let's let's see what else happened last week or in this past week. First of all, more American strikes. Believe it or not, America is very, very active in Syria and in the area of Iraq. American strikes on Iranian-backed militias in the t city of Al-Bukamal, in the Imam Ali uh, base, uh, left scores of dead people there. Another area that America has a base is a place called Al-Tanf. America has a base there, and America declared a no-fly zone right above it. And guess what? The Iranians wanted to provoke the Americans and started sending um, passenger jets, 747 and Airbus 340s and 330s, to fly from Tehran to Beirut right across this no-fly zone. America scrambled uh, F-15s that actually caused this passenger plane to uh, lose altitude instantly. Um, and that, of course, uh, ended up with the injury of several passengers as they landed in Beirut. Uh, Iran called it provocation. Iran is trying to cause some sort of incident that will uh, basically um, cause America to be embarrassed. Let me also move on to some more things that happen. Um, more weird stuff is going on in Iran. Another explosion two days ago 
in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corp um, missile base in the outskirts of Tehran, and another explosion, actually a series of explosions, in the island of El, uh, it, they call it El Keshem. And um, all of that, of course, is without uh, an Iranian um, acknowledgement that something really happened. They always say that's the heat, explosions, fire, malfunction. They don't admit that really something really is going on there. One more thing that I would like to tell you is that, remember we talked in the last few months, or excuse me, few weeks on the Turkish aggression in the Mediterranean. And last week I told you that Turkey invaded into Greek territorial waters and in order to start drilling for gas and oil. Well, believe it or not, but uh, a few days ago, the Greek Navy was about to start a war with Turkey as Turkish warships escorted the drilling ship that they sent. It ended up with Angela Merkel, the leader of Germany, the chancellor of Germany that called Erdogan and said, the Greek are serious, you better turn those ships back. And so he did. And if that's not enough, um, Turkey has been bringing nonstop shipments of weapons and some anti-aircraft uh, systems to Libya, if you remember. And they um, actually located in the Alwatia airbase. And believe it or not, two days ago, another airstrike of aircrafts that uh, nobody is willing to identify. It's either French, uh, Russian, or belongs to General Haftar. And all those anti-aircraft batteries were destroyed. Today, we noticed that the Turks are bringing F-16s as they were... Uh, making the runway in that airbase longer just for that particular thing. Uh, if that's not enough, we also had uh, more things that uh, are going on in, in Lebanon and more things that are going on in Libya. We know that General Haftar uh, just uh, striked um, several uh, tanks from the air that moved towards the city of Sirt. Uh, Basically, not a dull moment in the Middle East. In fact, the Middle East is now in one of its most tense situations um, in the past few years. It's quite amazing to watch it. And I know that in so many of the Western media and uh, all over America, they don't report those things. But um, a lot of um, what I call rumors of wars are, are really going on all around that particular place. So we end up with what started last Monday with a willing to retaliate and to avenge the killing of that man uh, by Hezbollah. And today, a group of Hezbollah terrorists try to infiltrate into an Israeli base and try to... Um, hit Israeli soldiers and launch a Russian-made cornet um, rocket that is anti-tank one and hit an Israeli Merkava tank. They failed. We killed them. Hezbollah claims that it never happened. Just about an hour ago, the Hezbollah releases um, a statement that says everything Israel reports is a lie. We never did anything. Now, it's interesting because they may say they never did anything, but let me show you. Let me show you. This is a video of the mother of the guy who was killed by Israel last week thanking Nasrallah for what he did today. Look, she's just saying right now. She basically says, I thank Nasrallah for revenging the death of my son. Now the score is settled. So Hezbollah says we never did anything. The mother of the dead person says, thank you, Hezbollah, for doing it. So you understand the level of credibility of the people that we are surrounded by. So now we, 
we got to the point, ladies and gentlemen, we got to the point where I would like to talk to you a little bit more about the importance of the city behind me and the nearness or what is the proximity basically of the rise of the person whom the world or Christians today call the Antichrist, but the world will adore as the most important person and admired one. And the reason why I thought it's important to talk about, first of all, I'm in Jerusalem. This is where he will eventually show his true face, go against Israel, and will rule for the last part of the seven years that he will uh, be here. And one of the reasons that I decided to, to say that, uh, to talk about that topic is because quite a lot of people look at what's going on right now in America and all around the world, and they get this wrong understanding that we are somewhere somewhat in the tribulation already. And at some point, we already see some things that will be imposed by the Antichrist. And I thought it is probably a great opportunity for all of us to try and understand what the Bible says regarding that particular person, regarding where he is going to come from, regarding the atmosphere in the world and what are the things that must happen prior to his rise in order for all of us to somehow recalibrate our position along the timeline that we have for the end times. And this is super important. So why don't I take you first, I would like to take you first to the fact, ladies and gentlemen, that um, yesterday, look at this, yesterday, Germany was rated the world's most admired country. The world's most admired country. Let me explain something. This is not the first year. This is, by the way, the third year in a row. America, if Germany was 44%, America is far behind in 33%, number two, and then comes China and Russia. And this was a pretty Gallup poll, pretty comprehensive one. If you're asking me, what's the deal? I want to di direct your attention to Germany and to Western Europe in particular. France and Germany and this part of the world. Because I want you to understand it's not for nothing that we see some this kind of admiration. You see, there is a spirit in this world of let's erase borders. There's a spirit in the world of globalism, of new world order. It is a spirit that has been there for a long time, but we see that every crisis that is happening, whether it's a war, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a natural disaster, they take advantage of these things in order to push their agendas. Even the death of uh, George Floyd has been exploited by them and is being exploited by them to push their agenda. And it's super important that you understand that Germany had become almost like the hub of multiculture, multinationality, and um, some sort of no more borders. And I would like to divert your attention to the fact that today Germany is the strongest country in the EU. Angela Merkel by far is the strongest leader in Europe today. Now, she's not admired by her own people. She's lacking charisma. She can't really take good care of her own people with all of the uh, immigration, with all of the um, violence that is going on. And even uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, way of handling things wasn't the best. But I can tell you folks that it's way beyond that. 
I want you to, to know that um, right now, Europe is in a state of a shock. And much of it has to do with the, the coronavirus. Now, I know that a lot, you know some of you believe this is not a real virus or this is not a, you know, such a um, maybe a, a serious thing. But let me tell you something. Not only that it's real and it is very serious and is afflicting many countries around the world. Now, it may not be deadly as, as people thought. Yes, I agree. It may have been man-made. I agree. But it's there. And it's afflicting countries and it's afflicting economies. And um, people are dealing with it. Now, uh, Europe. In 1957, we, all, we had the Rome Agreement. And keep that in mind. And the Rome Agreement was basically, hey, we're no longer different nations we're going to move together to create a blockade a chunk of land that borders means no no more anything we're going to have one currency we're going to have one economy we're going to have no more uh border inspections and in the 1980s in the city of schengen in luxembourg they signed the treaty the schengen treaty that basically uh, puts together over 20 different European countries as um, border free, which means you can literally travel between them without any paperwork because they are considered one entity for traveling. Guess what? COVID-19 comes and suddenly you see that Schengen means nothing. You suddenly see that countries are locking themselves in their borders, such as Italy, and then Spain, and then Portugal, and then you had, um, uh, you know, all the rest of them. And the coronavirus hit so many countries there so badly that they didn't want to I import cases from other European countries. And then you saw that it's not going well. Now, remember, the leftists are calling themselves progressive which means they consider themselves people that move forward while all the others are retarded and they are still backwards they're still back there they're you know old fashioned this is how they call themselves and at some point in on July 11 they decided covid-19 is behind us no need anymore to do anything they lifted the ban everybody started traveling and guess what we are having once again COVID-19 cases rising in Italy and in Spain and uh, in uh, other countries. And the interesting thing happened two and a half days ago when the UK suddenly said that anyone that comes from Spain back to the UK must be quarantined again. And that is, of course, all the people that cannot afford being quarantined flocked all the way to the airports in Mallorca and other uh, uh, in other um, islands there and basically they realized that um, it's not really working it's not really working why am I saying all of these things for the longest time Europe tried to build up an image of something greater than just a conglomerate of countries. And uh, for the longest time, Europe and specifically Germany and the area of France and, and, and also Belgium, this whole area had a very occultic and uh, um, um, interesting um, attraction to the Babylonian culture and Babylonian uh, uh, mindset. Let me tell you that um, when the EU built its parliament in Strasbourg, France, the EU basically built it in a shape of the Tower of Babel. Now, you may say this is not true, but I can tell you, take a look at this, uh, at this particular thing. Um, I, I thought I had it. Let me see. But uh, basically, um, Europe, uh, I mean, there is Peter Bruegel, the Dutch, um, uh, the Dutch uh, painter who painted uh, the Tower of Babel exactly in this shape. And Europe even was proud to look like the Tower of Babel. And it said, 
one country, many languages. Um, again, taking pride in the multicultural cultural aspect of it, and you can come from in wherever you want. There is no one God, there is no one religion, there is no one thing, we're all one. Of course, the European Council in Brussels has a woman rides the beast right there outside of the building that shows you again the direction that it is taking. And if that's not enough, by the way, I want you to see that in Berlin, you've got since 1930, the real altar of Zeus known as the seat of Satan uh, situated there in Berlin. This has been brought from the city of Pergamon in Turkey. And so you can clearly see that one in Berlin. Uh, if that's not enough, the Babylonian gate of Ishtar is in the same museum. Now, this is not a replica. That's the real thing. Uh, listen, you have to follow me because I am taking you somewhere right here. So you can clearly see that side by side by side with what is going on around the world with a lot of confusion, a lot of desperation, a lot of, um, um, I would say, um, um, hopelessness and anxiety, we can see that Europe has been already preparing itself for the longest time to give birth to something completely different. I want you to know that many people forget that it is the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament that already had a clear vision of the rise of the Antichrist. We know that in uh, the book of Daniel in chapter 7, excuse me, that this is chapter 9, but in chapter 7 we know that he already saw four beasts. And each beast that came was actually a symbol of a different country of a different empire and the last one was the most dreadful of all and that was the symbol of Rome if the first one was the symbol of Babylon and then you have the Medo-Persian and then the Greek and the last one was the Roman then the Bible says that from that last one there were ten horns and one of them spoke pompous words and so you can see that there is a direct connection to the rise of that person from the original area of the Roman Empire. I can also tell you that when you look at the 70 weeks vision of Daniel, you read after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Look, um, Daniel received that amazing, amazing um, uh, prophecy regarding the future of Israel. Israel and the future of this city behind me, of Jerusalem. And it's interesting because after 7 and 62, 69 weeks from the moment the decree to build Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes in 445 BC, the Bible says that exactly 69 weeks will pass and then Messiah will come and he will be cut off, not for himself. And the people, now watch this, and the people of the prince who is to come. This is not Messiah the prince. This is a prince, a leader, a strong leader of a, of a big empire. What are they going to do? They shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The so Roman Empire destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD. And then watch this, until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And watch what happens. As they speak of the Roman Empire, Daniel receives now the vision for the last week, which is obviously not in sequence of the first 69, because otherwise he would have he would be talking about 70 altogether. But he says, no, there is 69, and then there is the last one. And then he says, and he, as you can see, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. From the same area, there will be a new leader who will confirm a covenant of peace or a covenant for 
uh, with many for one week. That's seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In the middle of the week, he shall bring. Therefore, we know it will be a time when Israel is back in the land, a time when the temple is back. This is after the temple has been destroyed in 70 AD. How come we already have again sacrifice and offering? Because we're now in the future. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate and even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Ladies and gentlemen, so we see that it's from that last fourth beast that is the most dreadful of all comes the man. And from that same chapter 9 also, you can see same empire in the future somebody is going to come. And so now we establish that is not going to be Assyrian, as some think, because the Assyrian has to do with King Sennacherib. He's not going to be uh, Babylonian. He's not going, he is going to be from the same exact area. The first prince came to destroy the temple uh, in, uh, right after Messiah has entered and died. It's interesting because Western Europe and the ancient Roman Empire then in modern days has changed. The Bible says in Daniel that there will be 10 horns of which, out of which three were plucked out from the root and then he comes from them. Now watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Western Europe had 10 ancient tribes of which three do not exist anymore. The Visigoths are in Spain today. Anglo-Saxons are England today. Franks are in France. Alemanni are in Germany. The Burgundians are in Switzerland. Lombards, it's Italy, Suevi, Portugal. But there are three others that aren't mentioned anymore. They're not there anymore. And they have been rooted up. The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals are no longer there. So I believe with all of my heart, that we're talking about, definitely we're talking about a um, leader that is going to rise from Western Europe. If I may say, a good guess would be the area of Germany and France of today. As you can see, there's already an admiration for Germany even today. But I want you to know the world is going to be a little different than what it is today. And this is where we come to chapter 13 of the book of uh, Revelation. So let's read together because, again, a lot of people are mixing these things. The Bible says, and remember, the Antichrist has been mentioned several times in several places before the book of Revelation. We know that in, 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 in the book of uh, uh, Peter. We know that also in um the book of Thessalonians. But look at this. We also saw it earlier in the book of Revelation, even in chapter um, 11 and chapter 12. But look at this. In chapter 11, we hear about the two witnesses and how that beast that came from the abyss will kill them. This is him. In chapter 12, we know uh, that same beast is mentioned also uh, there as well. But watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 13. And, and it's very important that you get it because if you get this, you understand that he may be alive today, but he is not going to take position and rule for quite a, a substantial time for now because several things must happen first. But watch this. And then stood on the sand of the sea. I stood on the sand of sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Remember Daniel chapter 7. And on his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Remember. Now watch this. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth is like the mouth of a lion. All the four beasts that we see in Daniel 7 has as if as if that one swallowed them all and now shares the correct characteristics 
them uh, thereof. And watch this. It says, the dragon, Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Why is it so important? Because right now, some people suggest that um, some um, there's a new kingdom or a new united uh, uh, united uh, allied states, and there's going to be elections. The Antichrist is not going to be elected by people. His authority, his throne, and his power are coming directly from the dragon. And then he says, I saw one of his heads as if it has been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And watch this. All the world marveled and followed the beast. Now show me today one leader anywhere that the entire world is marveling with and is following. Not yet. Watch this. So they worshipped the dragon. Remember Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount to, to serve the Lord and do good. And when they see you and what you do, they will praise and worship your Father which is in heaven. You reflect that which you worship. And watch this. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The world is going to admire a leader the world is going to worship a leader and the world is going to be completely given to that lie. Now watch this. And then he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So you see his, uh, his first appearance is 42 months in which it's just speaking blasphemous things. And basically, he hates everything about God because he thinks he is God and he wants people to worship him. Blasphemy is coming and saying things against God. It's, it's coming against God. It's not anything else. And watch this. Watch this. After those 42 months, then... He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Isn't that interesting? Remember, he cannot show himself. He cannot reveal himself. He cannot come and step into the scene, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, before the restrainer is taken out of his way. The believers must be taken, must be raptured. And, and what is he having something to say against? Who? Against God, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Isn't that interesting? We're going to be in heaven, and he's going to be gossiping about us. I, I bet you there will be so many, I guess, attempts to explain how come we're gone, and how come we're taken? And he was granted to him to make war with the saints. And by, by the way, make, make, make no mistake. Make no mistake. Saints can be here either. Saints are hagios in, in, in Greek. It can either be the holy ones, but also those who are set apart. And I've heard enough commentaries to tell you that it could be those, of course, saints of the tribulation, those who became believers. But who predominantly became believers right after? If you read chapter 11, you know that after the 42 months, remember, what happened is that the two witnesses resurrected and went up to heaven and many people marvel and worship God and probably believed. And so he is now making a war with the saints to overcome them. And authority was given him 
over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life. So you see, all the non-believers, because anyone who trusts in Jesus, his name is mentioned, in, is written in the book of life. All of those worship him. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So you see, the saints of the tribulation are going to go through terrible time. He's going to be uh, uh, overpowering. Then watch this. And then I saw another. Watch this. So there is a political leader who is coming from the sea, which means he's new. He, ha he wasn't there. He is not someone we know. He is not something we've seen before. But then came another beast coming out of the earth. He's been here. He had some different hat. That second beast is not the Antichrist. It's the false prophets. And he had two horns like a lamb. Isn't that interesting? Like a lamb. He's, he's innocent. He has some religious affiliation. And spoke like a dragon. So on one hand, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. He is satanic by no mean, by all means. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire comes down from heaven and on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on, this, on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Anyone, you listen, anyone who did not worship was killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves, to receive a mark Watch this. It's important. A mark where? This is not a vaccine. This is not a treatment for a pandemic. It is a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. Why do we think that a simple vaccine that, by the way, I don't think, you know, people should take it if they don't want to. But it's absolutely not the mark of the this is the mark of the beast the mark of the beast will be introduced by the false prophets for people to worship the beast now is he here do we have the, the, the do we have them here are the look it's way into the second part of the tribulation three and a half if the tribulation begins tomorrow you still have at least three and a half years for that and it's not about any disease, and it's not about any pandemic, and it's not about anything of health. It is that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So now we understand, of course, the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, his number is 666. That's it. Now I, I can't go all the way into it. Key points. Where is Europe? Where is America? Where is Israel in this whole thing? As you can see, much of the book of Revelation is about Israel. You need to understand that. And um, Israel will be deceived. We know that those who will understand the schemes of the devil, when the Antichrist will declare himself as God, as Second Thessalonians says, that's what chapter 12 says, that God prepared a place for that for them, that nation that gave birth to the Messiah in the desert for how long? For those three and a half years, 1260 days. But what about the United States? 
and what about Europe? And what are the things that actually must happen first? Before we sail with our imagination that we are already in the tribulation or the mark of the beast is some vaccine that is going to, uh, you know, to be introduced tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, there are certain things that must happen first. First of all, there has to be a war where the extreme Islam is defeated and therefore the temple can be rebuilt on Temple Mount. Second, that war will lead to a peace, a false peace. It's not a peace that is introduced by a U.S. president. It's a peace that will be introduced by a European leader because there is no more America in Bible prophecy. At this point, you have to understand, Israel is after a war that America never helped it in that war. Where is America? There's a temple that is going to be built, and I would like to show you something regarding that temple. Believe it or not, look at this. Want world peace? 2014, Temple Institute in Jerusalem said, if you want a world peace, then you must build a third temple. That organization of Temple Institute launches campaign to raise funds for what? Draft plans of, of site, which if built, they say, would usher in universal harmony. Isn't that interesting? It's the same language that the Antichrist will, you know, introducing of harmony and peace, and it will be hand in hand with the building of the third temple. If you think that I am kidding you, ladies and gentlemen, there are already leaked plans for the third temple in Jerusalem. Now, we might think about them that they are lunatics, that they're extremists, that they are dreamers. They already have virtual reality mock-up of the holy temple. And you can actually go and see it already. All that they are waiting for. And they're moving all across the country teaching people that it's there. I want you, ladies and gentlemen, to understand this is real. And it's there. And there has to be a temple. There has to be worldwide hatred towards all believers that were taken already and anyone that is going to believe right after that throughout the tribulation. So there's a few things that needs to happen. And we need to remember, and I conclude here, we don't need to wait for the Antichrist. We need to wait for Jesus Christ. We don't need to give the Antichrist time. We don't need to think about what he will do and he will impose and he will give and all of those things. We need to be ready. We need to share the gospel. We need to tell people about salvation through him and him alone. And we need to be ready. The Bible says in Hebrew chapter 9 that to those who wait for him eagerly, he will come the second. Not for the issue of sin, but for the salvation of their body, for the rapture. So I want to encourage you all not to always look for things related to the Antichrist, but always, always, always look for the things that are related to Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your word, for your promises, great plans for the believers. We know that the tribulation will be a terrible time for Israel, but through the tribulation, this nation will enjoy salvation. We thank you, Father, that we're not destined to the wrath of God. We thank you that you will keep us out of the hour of trial that is about to come. We thank you, Father, that at no place where you describe the rapture, it says that we first have to go through the tribulation. In fact, we just heard anyone who believes, who goes through the tribulation, is going to be killed. And so how can Paul, how could Paul say that we that are alive and well will be taken unless it has nothing to do with the tribulation? And Father, I thank you that in order for this man of evil, this lawless one, to appear, the restrainer has first 
to be taken out of the way. So we thank you that we may not see him and we don't want to see him. But in order for the world to see him, they need to say bye-bye to us. Bless your name this evening from the city of the great king, from Jerusalem. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to encourage you to follow us on, um, on the social media. I uh, actually, um, this, is, uh, this is how you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, every week on beholdisrael.org, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, Behold Israel. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And shalom from Jerusalem.